Hello. I want to thank everybody for joining me for this segment one exam review. Congratulations on getting through the first four modules of the course. Um, it is our hope that this review will help you prepare for your exam that you will be taking very quickly. So our mission is to prepare you for the midterm review or the midterm exam. Uh, this review covers the first four modules of the course. Um, we always recommend that you attend a live session to do this so that you can ask questions and get clarification if you need it. Uh, but if you are unable to do that, then this is a great uh, second choice. So before we start, I just want you to take a self-inventory about how you currently feel about taking your midterm. So consider these options. And where are you now? And then we will ask you that question again when we are done. So we're going to start with Module 1. And Module 1 began with the scientific method. And the way this review is going to work is I'll go through the questions and talk about them. And then the next slide will be the same, except it will actually have the answers in it. Um, I'll be using a little um, finger pointing just to bring your attention to some things. So hopefully you can see that little finger that's pointing. So we want our problem to be in the form of a question, um, a question that can be uh, experimented about and so that you can determine the answer to the question. And then why do we bother doing research? Well, there might be other people who have done a similar experiment uh, that you can look at their results. Uh, or maybe you just need some background information so that you understand what it is that you're going to be dealing with. Uh, the hypothesis is always in an if-then format. So we have two different types of variables. The independent variable is the variable that the scientist will manipulate or change to try to cause an effect on the dependent variable, which is always what you measure. So if the hypothesis is written correctly, the independent variable will follow the if part, nice and easy to remember because independent and if both start with the letter I, and the dependent variable will follow the then. So if a plant receives more sunlight, then it will produce more fruit. Uh, the amount of sunlight would be the independent variable, and the amount of fruit would be the dependent variable. After you um, establish your problem in the form of a question and conduct research, you have your hypothesis in an if-then format. The next thing you will do is actually test your hypothesis in a procedure. Um, it's always best to just do that in a list format and always be as specific and detailed as you can uh, because remember, we always want our experiments to be replicated or repeatable. So somebody else should be able to take your procedure and be able to follow it to get the same results that you did. After the procedure is the analysis or the data. Um, and that's basically, that can be in a chart or a graph or a list. Um, it's always specific and measurable. We never use things like almost or most of or a little bit. You always want specific measurable data. And then you want to look at that data and see if it supports what you said would happen in your hypothesis. The conclusion then is just a simple statement um, that states whether or not your data supported your hypothesis. You don't have to go, you should never say because, you know, and explain it. It's just a simple statement. My data supported my hypothesis. Uh, plants that received more sunlight did produce more fruit. It certainly is fine if it did not support it. You would just say, my results did not support my hypothesis. Plants receiving more sunlight did not produce more fruit. Okay, so moving on. I talked a lot for just a little bit of these answers. Um, but there are your answers. You have your problem in the form of a question. The reasons we research is to get background information or get the results if somebody else already did it. Hypothesis is always in the if-then format. If being followed by the independent variable, then being followed by the dependent variable. So when we have our independent and dependent variable, remember um, the independent follows the if and the dependent follows the then. So just read these statements. And in your mind, we want to know what the independent variable is and the dependent variable. This will be tested very, very heavily, so make sure that you can do this. 
if you water the plant, then the plant will grow. What's your independent variable? We said it would follow the if part, right? So it's going to be watering the plant. Then the plant will grow. So the growth of the plant is what you're going to measure. That's going to be the dependent variable. If you text while driving, then you're 23 times more likely to be involved in a car crash. Independent variable follows if, if so the independent variable is texting while you're driving. And the dependent variable, what you measure, would be um, the likelihood of being in a car crash. So you would, you would uh, collect data on car crashes. OK? Um, you don't have to create your own hypothesis statement. Just make sure that you understand this very clearly. Independent variable follows the if. It is what the scientist manipulates or changes to cause the effect. Dependent variable follows the then. It is what you measure. Properties of water. There are lots of properties of water. Water is fascinating. You'll find out about water in lots of different ways in this course. High heat capacity basically means that water has a great ability to retain heat. It can hold on to a lot of heat. This is very important when we talk about currents and just the way that um, the water in the oceans and the currents can actually move different temperatures and, and change temperatures in the climates of regions. Universal solvent um, simply means that things dissolve very well in water. That's due to its polarity. Um, it has a, a negative side to the, the molecule and a positive side, right, H2O. So, so the hydrogen is positively charged. The oxygen is negatively charged. They will each constantly seek out the opposite charge to bond with. That makes things really, really want to dissolve in water. And then surface tension is the, um, it's almost like a film on the top of the water, right, that allows insects to um, actually walk on water. So if you were to draw the lines here, this would be a great representation of heat capacity solvency, and surface tension. Um, another property of water is the density of water. The mathematical um, representation of density is mass per unit volume. Um, so M over V would be how you would calculate it. Basically, it's how much matter is in a given amount of space. So how much stuff is in a given amount of space. So if you look up here at these pictures, this both of these boxes are the same size, so that's the volume. If there's more in it, then that makes it more dense. If there's less in it, then that makes it less dense. Um, so water at standard temperature and pressure, molecular water has a, a set density. That's one of the properties of it. Um, but when we talk about water in the ocean, um, then we talk about different things that can make it more or less dense. So the question is, what's going to be more dense, warm water or cold water? And what's going to be more dense, salt water or fresh water? We know that temperature and salinity form the thermohaline current. So those two things, temperature and salinity, affect the density of water. And here's how they affect it. Cold water is more dense, and salt water is more dense. So the cold water and the salt water are always going to sink below the fresh water and the warm water. So now that I have said that, let's see how much you remembered. A uh, little true-false statement here. True or false, cold water is denser or more dense than hot water. How about the next one? Fresh water is denser, more dense than salt water. And then let's put that into practice. So true or false, fresh water will float on top of salt water when it enters the ocean. And let's look at these answers. Cold water is denser than hot water. That is true. You can think about when you get cold, you shiver, you bring everything in, right? Things get tighter. Fresh water is denser than salt water. That's false. We know that salt is more dense than water, so salt water is going to be more dense than fresh water. And so will fresh water float on top of salt water? Yes. Because the salt water is more dense, it will sink below the fresh water that is less dense. And that was it for Module 1. Still with me. Congratulations. Module 2, here we go. This is all about navigation to start with. Um, so basically, all we want to do here is talk about 
um, tools that measure longitude versus latitude. And here's how I remember it. Um, I start with latitude. Latitude has the A sound in it, right? Ah, you see this A that I'm pointing to. So the words of the, the names of the tools that measure latitude all have A's in them. The Astrolab measures latitude. The Quadrant measures latitude. And the Cross Staff measures latitude. The only one of these that measures longitude is the chronometer. Longitude has an O. Chronometer has an O. That's how I remember it. If you have a better way, that's perfectly fine. Um, but that, those are the answers. And something that you will be asked on your test is basically what inventions made uh, navigation so much easier. Um, so we have GPS and the, and the two-way radio that came along much later than these other rudimentary um, devices. So when we talk about longitude and latitude, here's how I remember it. I remember lat rhymes with fat. And I look at the Earth and I think, ooh, the fattest part is right around the middle, right where the equator is. That's the fat part. That is latitude. So latitude runs from east to west. Or you can think, oh, longitude it is a long way from the North Pole to the South Pole. That is a long way. So that's lines of longitude that run north to south. Now, you can't have something that is north or south of a line that runs north or south, right? So they have to be measured the opposite way that they run. So latitude runs east to west, but it's measured in degrees north or south of the equator, right? So all of these blue lines are lines of latitude down here. Those are positive numbers going up to the north. And then we have negative numbers going down to the south. So latitude runs east-west and is measured in degrees north or south of the equator. Longitude runs a long way from north to south, and it's measured in degrees east or west of the prime meridian. And again, to the east would be positive numbers, and to the west would be negative numbers. And if you didn't see the pictures of the world and you just put the prime meridian right down the middle of the equator, it would look just like the x and y axis of a math graph. And you know that when you plot a math graph, the numbers above it are positive, and the ones below it are negative. The ones to the right are positive, and left are negative. So it's just like that. So for your answers here, longitude runs north-south, latitude runs east-west, longitude measures east to west of the prime meridian, and latitude measures north to south of the equator. Okay, here we go, rocky shore organism. So when you think about the rocky shore, you should think about those big rocks, the waves crash on it, the tide comes in, the tide goes out, and there's lots, it's a very harsh environment for organisms to have to live in. They've got to be able to attach to the rock so that they don't get swept away. Um, they can't, they've got to find a way not to dry out when the sun comes out and they leave. They've got to be able to tolerate high salinity because when the, uh, the tide goes out and the tide pools start to evaporate, the salt level goes up. So basically, all of these organisms have adapted. And adaptation, by the way, is a trait or characteristic that's passed down through the generations because it enables um, an organism to live successfully in its habitat. So let's look at these. Seaweed have hold fast to attach themselves to the rock, and a slimy mucus. And I think that the easiest way to remember this is the slimy mucus, because if you've ever grabbed seaweed, it feels slimy, right? The limpet has a muscular foot and a cup-shaped shell. Um, if you've never seen a limpet, to help you remember that, you could probably think about the foot and the limp. You limp when you have a bad foot. I'm reaching here, but maybe that'll help. Barnacles, I think you've all seen barnacles. They're in, in groups, and they're impossible to move, right? They, they actually use a cement and cement themselves to the rocks. They will close up to conserve their moisture, and they have that conical shape. And if you've ever tried to touch them or if you've stepped on them, you know that they're very sharp at the top of that cone and can cut you. Sea squirts, um, basically, they look kind of like those water-filled 
oh, what are those things called? Those toys, you know, and you can stick your fingers in both ends of them. Um, so they have a soft jelly-like body, and they're able to store water so that they don't dry out. And then lichens um, basically are, are, they look sort of like an algae that grows on the, the rock, um, but they are totally salt resistant, um, which is very helpful to them, and they are going to be found in the splash zone. Don't be crabby, let's be savvy. I didn't make that up, but I got to tell you, I kind of like it. So crustaceans, um, you did an article, you read an article about the rules for the lobster industry in Maine. Um, they talked about shorts being the, the lobsters that were too small to harvest. Uh, they v-notched the females so that people would know that they were females and they were breeding and you're not supposed to take them. Um, they had very large lobsters were not supposed to be taken. They're considered super studs, right? They breed well and make lots of babies, so you don't want to take those. They had all sorts of rules about what you can do um, to collect the lobsters. Um, crustaceans have in common the fact that they've got the exoskeleton. They've all got segmented bodies and jointed appendages. They're decapods. The one thing that they don't all have is swimmerettes. So I went over all of that, oh, some of the, the rules that I didn't go into, 800 traps, summer Sundays or no fishing. Um, they've got size uh, requirements, right? It's got to be at least three and a quarter, but no larger than five inches. And like we said, they don't all have the swimmerettes. Still in Module 2, we have the light zone. So these are the zones of the ocean based on light penetration. Lots of students, when I ask this question on an oral quiz, give me the benthic zone as a light zone. Um, I guess it must have been in the same lesson, but benthic simply means the floor of the ocean. It has nothing to do with light penetration because depending on how deep it is, it could be you know an inch of water above it or a mile, so it could be any of these. But the word photic means light. So the photic zone is going to have any amount of light. It can vary by depth, vary by cloud cover. It just means light. When you put a prefix in front of the word photic, it will describe the light. So the prefix A means no or not. So that's going to be where there's no light at all. The prefix dis, whether it's spelled D-Y-S or D-I-S, dis means bad. So dysphotic means bad light. There's enough light to see, but not enough for photosynthesis. And the prefix U, EU, means abundant or lots of. So the euphotic zone has the most light. That's where photosynthesis occurs. Depending on the version of the test you get, honestly, it might not even have euphotic on it, um, in which case if it asks about photosynthesis, you would say the photic zone. So the correct answers are aphotic um, has no visible light. Um, photic would be the variable light. Dysphotic would be enough light for organisms to see, but not for photosynthesis. And euphotic would be where photosynthesis happens. But again, if euphotic is not an answer choice, um, and it talks about photosynthesis, then your, your answer choice would be photic, because that is where there is light. Um, then we talked about the HMS Challenger. You had to... Uh, pretend like you were a sailor on the ship and talk about lots of different things. Um, one of your essay choices might be to defend a statement about the Challenger being the most important marine voyage ever. Um, so the things that you would want to include in that essay response would be the fact that they discovered thousands of new organisms. Um, they measured the depth of the ocean through those sounding tools. Uh, they studied meteorology. They had all these new tools and inventions. Um, and it was multidisciplinary, meaning it wasn't just marine biologists. They had chemists and physicists and um, astronomers and all kinds of different scientists on there working together. Um, it was risky. They were gone for a very long time under very harsh conditions. And um, they, were, they were subject to several diseases, scurvy, tuberculosis, um, what was the other one? It's on the next page. I guess I should just turn the page. Um, the other thing you might have to do is when you look at this map to be able to tell what the dates are. The first number is the month. 
and the last number is the last two digits of the year. Remember, this was in the 1800s, not the 1900s, so this would have been September of 1875. And the sandy beach. So the sandy beach, starting with the water, is called the surf zone, right? Easy to remember because that's where you would surf. As you come out, the area that I'm pointing to between the fingers up there, where the tide sometimes covers it up and sometimes doesn't, is called the intertidal zone, right? Because it's between the tides. Where the sand is still flat but dry is called the backshore. And then beyond the back shore where it piles up into hills is called the dunes. And you will be expected to put these organisms in the correct zone. Um, so looking down here at the matching section first, the intertidal zone has the sand mussels. They look like that. The back shore has amphipods. Amphipods look like this little guy here. The surf zone that's in the water has pompano. Pompano is a type of fish. And the dunes are where the beetles live, and you know what beetles look like. Um, adaptations of the sandy beach include burrowing. That's the biggest one. They'll dig down in the sand um, not only to escape predators and the pounding waves, but also the heat of the sun. They also have tidal or lunar rhythms, which means basically they live their life based on the moon, not the sun. Most organisms have... Um, like solar rhythms, you know, we're either nocturnal or we're diurnal. We're either active at night or active in the day. It's all based on sunlight. Um, these guys, their life is based on the tides. Um, a lot of people get the answer wrong on this assignment about the adaptations, and they all say something about um, tube feet, but we remember from Module 2 that that is for rocky shore organisms. You can't really attach to the sand, right, it's going to all drift away, sift out. So that's for the rocks. Burrowing is the big one here. Sea turtles. So the difference between a tortoise, a terrapin, and a sea turtle basically um, is where they live is the biggest deal. So tortoises are land creatures. Terrapins are semi-aquatic freshwater. So those are the turtles that you see in our lakes, ponds, and rivers around here, um, or that you might get at a pet store, they are in and out of the water. And sea turtles are completely aquatic and uh, salt water. So if data shows that a female sea turtle lingers or hangs out, stays around along a Florida coast during the summer, what might she be doing? Um, you want to know that they only would come near land for one reason, and that's because they're either getting ready to or they just finished laying eggs. So the only reason they would ever come on land is if they are laying eggs or if they're like these babies and they're trying to get from their nest to the ocean. Once they get out there, they don't come back to land until it's time to nest. So look it down here at your choices. If you were to see a sea turtle washed up on the beach, what would you do? Here's your choices. Push it back in the water, take a picture, scoop it up, yell for your friends, stay back and watch from a distance, or call a sea turtle preserve. So let's go on and see what our answers are. You always want to give them their space, stay back, watch from a distance. You don't need to do any of those other things. You would only need to call a, a sea turtle preserve if necessary. If it were an adult that seemed to be beached and in distress and couldn't move itself, you would probably want to call that. If it's just the little guys trying to make it out to the ocean, um, just give them some space and they can probably do that just fine by themselves if you will give them the space to do that. Okay, so this is about beach erosion. Remember you did a comparison chart on four types of erosion prevention methods. Jetties and breakwaters, which are hard structures. Beach renourishment, which is actually bringing in sand from somewhere else to replace the sand that has eroded. And planting dune grasses. Um, so that was lesson 308. You might just want to have that out in front of you when you take your exam because you will have to recognize these methods simply by their pros and cons. Okay, so jetties, jetties basically are, are famous for doing a really good job on one side of them, preventing erosion from the downshore drift 
um, on one side, but the other side, basically, the erosion speeds up. Uh, breakwaters does a good job of breaking up the energy of the waves. Uh, but it tends to be an eyesore, which just means it looks ugly. People don't like looking at them. And, it, you know, a lot of debris and seaweed might might stick to it, get, get hung up on it, and look bad. Beach Renourishment does a great job by bringing in extra sand. Um, but the sand that comes in will still erode. And, in fact, um, there's evidence that shows it erodes faster than the natural sand. Um, you could also bring in organisms that aren't native to that beach. Um, and, and change the ecology of the beach. Planting dune grasses um, definitely does speed the natural recovery. It's a natural thing. It, it offers um, habitat for animals. It's self-sustaining, um, and it's very cheap. But the cons is a lot of times it needs fences, fencing to hold it up. If, it, uh, if there's a storm or something, all of that could be lost, and it, it does take a long time, and it's kind of labor-intensive as well. Oil spill labs. So um, the big deals with oil spill labs, the, the methods of trying to clean them up, the biggest are sorbents, which means absorb or soak up. So that might be, you know, some sort of sponge or hay or hair or anything that's going to soak up the oil. Skimmers down here, um, skim means to scoop or scrape. So that's like something mechanically getting it up off of the top of the, the water. Uh, dispersants, to disperse means to spread out. So these are chemicals that you put down on the oil that doesn't actually remove it. It just breaks it into smaller particles so that it dilutes faster um, in the ocean. Um, burning is not recommended just because of the ecological damage that it does. Um, or you can vacuum it or um, suction. So let's look. When you get to this section, you actually have to recognize these by a picture. So we've got some pictures for you. Um, so this thing up here is actually, oh, and a boom I didn't talk about. Booms don't remove the oil. It contains the oil in one area um, so it doesn't spread out. So booms are usually used in conjunction with other methods. So this top picture is actually a picture of a boom that's made of an absorbent material. So it contains it, and then when the oil comes up to it, it soaks it up. Um, this one down here, it, this is the boom that goes across. I'm at the third picture now with my little finger going across. The boom is holding the oil on this side, and then there are these um, sorbent uh, sheets of material that they put down to absorb it. The bottom picture has the boom over here containing it, and then this is like a mechanical skimmer that goes across the top of the water uh, to bring it up. There um, are also boats that drag skimmers behind it that look like big scrapers. And this, the, the chemical dispersants are typically put down with an airplane, kind of like a crop duster. Uh, so if you see a picture of an airplane, you know that that's a dispersant. And all the way to Module 4, thanks for hanging in there with me. So phytoplankton, oh, so important. Phytoplankton, remember phytoplankton are plankton that look and act like plants. They are not plants because plants are multicellular. Phytoplankton are single cellular. But in all other respects, they, they seem like plants. So the pros are the same as it would be for plants. They're primary producers, so they're at the base of the food chain. They create oxygen and they remove carbon dioxide. And all of that is because they are photosynthetic. Um, the cons of phytoplankton, you did a lesson called too much of a good thing. So even though phytoplankton are good, if there's too much, we call that a harmful algal bloom or a red tide event. Um, when dinoflagellates, which are the second most common type of phytoplankton, grow too much too fast, they can cause big problems in the environment, um, including releasing toxins in the water that can be um, you know, harmful or fatal to fish and shellfish and even humans, um, to creating dead zones. Um, the reason that they overgrow is because of nutrients, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, that will trigger that, um, trigger that phytoplankton to start growing. And then it's fed, or it's made worse by lots of sunshine, warm water, and a lack of wind and rain. Um, so that was phytoplankton. 
We talked about marine iguanas. They live in the Galapagos Islands only, and man, are they good-looking creatures. There's a picture one down there. There were lots of adaptations. They've got salt glands to help them um, remove any excess salt from when they're swimming and eating in the ocean. They've got broad, flat tails to help them swim. They've got blunt snouts. See how jacked up his nose is, all smushed in, so that the mouth can get close to the rocks to scrape off the algae that they eat, um, and really sharp claws to climb in and out of the water on the rocks. Uh, the biggest decline in the marine iguana population comes from invasive species, mostly like pets, dogs and cats, or even rats that might have come over on ships, things that were not on the island to start with. So the marine iguanas um, basically evolved without any of those predators. And now that all those predators are there, um, it's causing real problems for them. So you can look at this real quick. I just said it. Um, but take a look at this in writing for those of you who like to look at it. Okay, moving on. So we just talked about dogs and cats and rats being an invasive species for the marine iguanas. An invasive species is something that is introduced into an ecosystem or a habitat that hasn't been there, that basically doesn't belong there. And you're expected to understand what kind of effects that could have on the existing food web of an environment. So if you look at this picture, um, this star here represents what would happen if an invasive species, so if a type of fish were introduced into this environment that wasn't normally here, and this thing fed on herring, right? So nothing eats this, but this invasive species eats herring. So what sort of effect would that have on all these other species? So it would disrupt the food web. This is going to be an essay question if you get it. Um, it would cause everything to go out of whack because there's going to be a decrease in herring, right, because these guys are eating the herring. Well, if there's not as many herring, then there's going to be more zooplankton, right? The zooplankton is going to um, kind of go up because it, it has lost a predator. Well, if the population of zooplankton goes up, then the population of phytoplankton goes down because there's more of these eating these. And if the phytoplankton goes down, then basically everything dies out because that's the base, right? So you just need to be able to talk intelligently about the fact that these invasive species affect the entire food web. So it's, it's very important. I know that that was an honors assignment, so not everybody did it. But you do need to understand the concept of what introducing something like this into an existing food web would do uh, to every member of that food web. So this, I'm not even sure if this was in a lesson for you guys or just the fact that they're going to ask you about it on the exam, kind of just can you read about something and get the important information out of like a legal document type of thing and figure out what they're saying. So when you look at this, this is the um, Endangered Species Act, uh, which basically talks about, you know, how organisms are identified and placed on those lists to be protected. So do I have a note? Yes, here we go. So you should be able to identify that the Endangered Species Act will protect threatened organisms. It provides penalties um, for hunting or disturbing those protected organisms. And it provides a list of endangered and threatened and at-risk organisms. So food webs, um, basically you are expected to, to understand what these terms mean um, as far as primary producer. Remember, if it's a producer, it does not eat anything else. It produces its own energy. Um, at this point of the game, all you need to know is that almost every producer is photosynthetic, so it gets its energy from the sun. Primary means first. Consumer means it does eat something. Primary, again, eats means first. So this first consumer is going to eat the primary producer. 
and it gets 10% of its energy. Secondary, obviously, is the secondary consumer eats the primary consumer. It gets 10% of the 10%, which is 1%. Tertiary means third, so it gets 10% of the 10 of the 10. And quaternary means fourth, so it gets 10% of the 10% of the 10%. So remember, only 10% passes on from one level to the next. The other 90%, most of it, is um, transformed into heat and given off into the environment that way. So you not only need to know about the transfer of energy from one trophic level to the next, but if you are given organisms like up here, you need to be able to recognize what the primary producer, primary consumer, and all of that is. Um, so I think you all know what a penguin is. We just talked about what phytoplankton was. An orca is a killer whale, right? That's a top predator. Shad is a type of fish. And copepods are kind of like those amphipods. They're very low, um, a type of, of zooplankton. So when we put those in order, we know that the phytoplankton is the primary producer. It's going to be eaten by the copepod, which will be eaten by the fish, which will be eaten by the penguin, which will be eaten by the orca. And again, um, starting from the bottom and going to the top, Primary producer gets 100% of energy from the sun. Primary consumer gets 10% total, 1%, 0.1, 0.1 and 0.01%. Each level as you go up, you just move that decimal point one place to the left to get the total percentage. Oh my goodness, we're already to the end? I'm pretty excited. You should be excited. I did that really fast. Good for you guys for hanging in there with me. So now, after going through this, now how do you feel about taking your midterm? And I am super, super hoping that everybody is A, B, or C. There's no shame in C if you still want to study some more. Man, if you knew it all, good for you. If you learned a lot, you're ready to make an A. I'm so, so happy that I could help a little bit. If you are letter D, then you need to make sure that you reach out to your teacher and get some more help. So if you still have questions, you want to give your teacher a call. Do you want to make you aware of the module review guides? They are very, very helpful, and you can use them on your exam. If you go to Lessons, and then Module 1, and then scroll down to the bottom of the list of lessons, there's your Module 1 review guide. You do the same thing for Module 2, 3, and 4. I promise you, if you have those Module Review Guides filled out, you cannot go wrong on the exam. Good luck, everybody, and thanks again for listening.